Now we're here with Andrew Morrison and Alistair MacDonald from the Clydeside Distillery. And there's a special reason for that, because it must be a very exciting day for you tomorrow, as you will release your first whiskey in less than 24 hours. But first of all, uh, before the whiskey, there's always a distillery. And let's talk about the distillery first. Uh, what was the actual reason for building Clydeside Distillery? Uh, it, it was really uh, a couple of things. Um, AD Rattery, our sister company, which is predominantly an independent bottling uh, company, um, you know, we were um, growing the company, but realizing that re stock replenishment was becoming harder and harder and harder. And, and, you know, you start developing great relationships with importers and distributors and, and you, you see the popularity of the brands and product increasing. But the challenge was always there. OK, so that, We've sold this. How did we replenish it? The replenishment costs were going higher. It was getting scarcer. And um, having spoken to my dad, you know, the, all these efforts, we, we felt that we really needed to one day be in control of our own supply mm -hmm. uh, for the for the longevity. Uh, and also, you know, our family's got quite a strong heritage in the industry, so we felt that it would really the opportunity to take advantage of all that experience. And so distilling seemed to, getting back into distillation seemed like the, the obvious next step. Obviously it's quite a big next step. So there's no kind of medium ground. So it, it was, it was uh, something we thought long and hard about, but felt that it was something we needed to do to, to protect our future in the industry. Okay. And talking about heritage, there's a nice story about uh, the place where you built the distillery in Glasgow and your family so uh can you tell us about that yeah it was my uh my dad's great grandfather um uh, was a very prominent builder in glasgow his firm was morrison and mason and they built some of the very iconic buildings in glasgow um uh, many of the the ones you see throughout the city uh and his firm was involved in building the queen's dock which is the shipping yard uh in glasgow the very famous shipping yard that uh, all, a lot of the goods, sugar, rum, tobacco, whiskey, all these things kind of came in and out of Glasgow. And the pump house building was the building that controlled the gate to allow ships into the dock. And so um, it, was, it was actually by coincidence, we discovered this after we'd purchased the building. So it's sometimes fate just aligns, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a fantastic um, to find that story and to add to the heritage that we have on site here and, and what we're doing. So it, it's a really nice piece to the story. So in some way you come full circle with this distillery, don't you? Well, um, that's a wonderful uh, combination of uh, old structures, tradition and modern design. Was that your briefing when you started to build this distillery? And uh, what was the thought behind that? Yeah, well, the original pump house building was built in 1877. So obviously that's a historically significant building in Glasgow. So those very, very strict. When we first started talking to, to the city council about planning permissions and, and what we wanted to do, there was a couple of remits. One was no warehousing. You know, they didn't want a big warehouse in the city centre. So that was fine. And the second was they had quite strong design principles now in Glasgow and, and, and what their plans for the waterfront is. So mm. the historic building was obviously to be left exactly as is, which was fine. Uh, but it, it made it very clear we couldn't do any distilling in that building because venting and fire had, you know, it, so that's where we knew we had to build the extension part for the, the distillery section. And their remit um, within Glasgow is very modern materials, lots of glass, lots of zinc cladding, which is great because there's some lovely looking buildings now on the waterfront. The problem for us is they pick the most expensive materials. So, because so, they don't have to pay for it, but it does, it, 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 now that we're here, we do have a very striking distillery of the, the old uh, sandstone and the, you know, the zinc cladding and the glass and the stills looking down the river. So it's quite an iconic, site now which is and you have quite a view from the still house don't you absolutely yeah. yeah it's it's a very unique view actually because most of glasgow looks across the water and our still house actually looks down the river clyde so a very unique view from there when i prepared for the interview i 
I was fascinated by the fact that you both learned your trade from doing from from ver the very beginning. And let's start with you, Elster. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your career? Yes, it's a, an interesting one to say the least. I started, uh, I'm actually a native of Isla, so I started at Bullmore Distillery, uh, which was then under the ownership uh, of one Tim Morrison of Morrison Bullmore Distillers. And that was back in 1984. So I started as an apprentice engineer and I moved to Glasgow to, to finish my apprenticeship and get my college, etc. Uh, and once my time was out, I got the opportunity to be a distillery engineer with Ockintosh and Distillery, which I've done for a number of years again, probably about 12 years. And then they reviewed our, our engineering, distillery's engineering post and created a role for a distillery's engineer. So I then got a week at Bowmore, a week at Glengarry, a week at Auchintosh, and a week in head office, and uh, which gave me a kind of really good understanding of how different styles of distilleries worked, and you know different types, different Highland, Lowland, and Isla distilleries, and you know all the the challenges that came with the, the engineering side, the technical side, as well as production. So. Then in uh, 2011, I got the opportunity to move into production. It was always on my uh, appraisal and that career progression uh, section to say I would like to run engineering or be involved in production. So I got a call to see if I was interested in uh, a job in production in 2011, and that was to, to manage Auchintosh. So I'm still a manager at Auchintosh and uh, done that for six years. And then obviously the, through these my time with Morrison Bowmore, it changed hands to, to Centauri and then Beam Centauri. And there was a lot of changes going on and really good job, really good company to work for. But I've seen this shiny new pin in the horizon and made a couple of inquiries and, and thought, you know, how nice it would be to be involved in a brand new distillery. And, and moving back with the Morrison family was a real strong pull as well, you know, because as much as, you know, it, it's a family feel business, and it's back to being, you know, part of a, a small team that's, that's going to hopefully create a, a wonderful product that uh, as you'll see tomorrow and uh, be able to give us some feedback on. So that, that's the sort of kind of overview, six years in production management at Auchintosh and before uh, moving along the, the river to here. So thoroughly enjoying it so far. Yeah. So what is it that fascinates you in, in, in the whiskey industry? Why did you stay in the industry for 30 years? Well, if I tell the truth, to be honest, a uh, it was a route into engineering. I had no in inkling in whiskey at the age of 17. And <laughs> in fact, the smell of it at Bowmore kind of put me off. But as you come through the years, you know, the culture's changed. The, you know, the whole, I suppose, uh, there's no lead patches on casks anymore as it used to be back then. But, you know, it's the, the whole, everything has improved from health and safety to, you know, product quality to, I would say, to more premium products. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, that, that for me, seeing the, the, the transformation from 1984 right through to the, the current day and a lot of it you know has really improved since these days and and being part of you know what i would say is a historic product being in glasgow first distillery in over 100 years in the city to, to open up a uh, you know that excites me you know it's, it's all about you know putting out a product for glaswegians to enjoy yeah so and what what's the exact uh Respons uh, responsibility you have here at the Clydeside Distillery. Can you tell yeah, me? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm overall responsible for the you know the production, day-to-day -day production, you know, the, the bulk production of the new make spirit. Uh, you're involved in everything from a health and safety for a site, overall health and safety site, you're a responsible person. Uh, obviously, the, the quality control, the analysis, and, and just basically running with a, a small team of good production operators and uh, so yeah a lot to keep us busy the product itself and then you know we, from the start it was about creating a, a lowland style it was going to be of good quality and you had all the trials and all the tribulations of, of getting that product to where we wanted so we done about five six weeks of trials in the initial stage so you were involved in all, all that and I took a lot of experience from working with Suntory and some of the detail that they went into in the past and you know to Great. So we came here with a lot of optimism that wanted to try and achieve from, the, you know, the clear wort and various other fermentation, the 72-hour fermentation, the slow distillations, but I can come on to that later in one of your other I think, questions. I think Alistair is being modest as well, because when you, when you say what what does his data today, it basically involves everything, because we ha we do have a small team here, and it's it's one of the things that's, that I found so 
great about Alistair's background is having a, an engineering background as well is so helpful because when things things go wrong mm -hmm. and to have someone that can look at it and say oh don't worry I know how to fix that rather than having to get someone from up in the highlands there in an engineering company yeah, so he, yeah. if he, he's that, being modest he, he, that, that he is deals one with of, everything that yeah. is one i forgot about you're right yeah. there i mean i have had the spanner the spanners have been out on a few occasions and you know as you say you can guide you can understand and it's it's about cost saving at this early stage as well you know from from that you, you just don't want contractors coming in so nobody's going to pull the wool over my eyes from a you know an engineering background technical side so it's, it's important to have that so that's a kind of I mean, trade as well. Yeah, interesting. Well, uh, let's talk to you, and uh, Andrew. And well, because or despite your family background, you've been from one of uh, the, the the most influential uh, whiskey families in in Scotland. Uh, you decided to take no shortcuts in your career, right? Please tell us about what you did so far. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's it's kind of interesting. Something when when you grow up around something so much you don't really pay attention to it and so you know I remember summers we used to go over to Isla for a couple of weeks and we had a house in Bowmore and I would run around in the malting floors and I'd you know you know jump off the walls <laughs> and be in the warehouses and I never really thought anything about it because the whiskey was it was always around me it was never something that I, I took great interest in because it was just always there uh, I, I make fun when I lived in San Francisco, the amount, the amount of people that actually never visit Alcatraz because it's always there. You know, you always think you'll do it. And so whiskey was never really something I thought I was going to get involved in. And uh, when I, f I did business and finance degree at university and I moved to California to work for an e-commerce company, e-commerce and marketing. And uh, that's really where my interest uh, was. And then eventually um, I was developing a skill set that I thought would be starting, would be quite useful, uh, but I didn't really want to get involved in the family business till I, I, I really felt I could add some value. So after working for a big e-commerce company in San Francisco, I then uh, worked for our US importer being a sales guy. And I did that for several years where I would be in the marketplace selling brands that had nothing to do with our company uh, in liquor stores, selling uh, a lot of unknown brands. And it was great because it, it, it taught me uh, ultimately what the consumer wants, uh, price point, marketing, uh, um, brand positioning and dealing with retailers at that face to face level. So I did that for a long time with the US importer and then slowly evolved into developing products for that marketplace and then eventually into ADR developing markets internationally and then I really the distillery was was my big project right so and now the work you all put into this distillery pays off with the first whiskey the the Clydeside whiskey uh it's released tomorrow on Friday uh when the interview is published as well uh in German we have to wait a little bit long about three to four weeks I, I've heard uh, but tell us about this whiskey. What makes your Stop Cross whiskey so clyde ish Yes, I mean, uh, right from the, the, the off, we wanted to create a lowland style whiskey that, you know, that would be recognized because as you, you, you know that, you know, lowland whiskies are, you know, they've got a challenge against the highlands and the islands. So it's about doing something and it's different so so we wanted to focus on a lot of the, the things i mentioned earlier about a good quality malted barley initially so we actually we, we've now got a what we call a growers group set up with seven scottish farms that produce just for clyde sites so we've got that traceability and you know we can monitor a small growers group which is i think is important to us and it's also important to the growers to have that link with the, the clyde side the next stage was to to generate a clear what you know we always felt as though that a clear what created a more fruity character depending on the fermentation so we've, we've done a lot of trials on the creating this clear what that we you know we'll focus on now here and it's one of our unique selling points is basically the clear clear what and we'd, we're really proud of that because that is a hard thing to achieve especially with older distilleries and so having a new kit meant we could focus on that. So we've got a real good clear what that helps in the fermentation side. The next stage was, you know, I'd 
done a lot of trials with fermentation and 72 hours was this average 72 hours was a kind of optimum fermentation time that created a good character you know wash and spirit as well so we thought let's have a, a plan for that stainless steel washbacks again that wasn't my choice it was already in place but it is my preference as well against the the, the wooden washback so i had a lot of you know kind of building the the flavor I was there, the flavour profile from that. And then we had the, the yeast, and I had worked with uh, anchor yeast, Lalamand yeast, as it's now called, a dried yeast. And, you know, it's about how you, you can uh, rehydrate that and, you know, use that against the time and the temperatures to create that fruity character that we want to then bring into the still house. And then the still house, I always remember thinking back to my Bo Moore days and how the, the old manager used to shout at the stillman stop running that bloody spirit hot if you're running hot spirit you're running poor spirit that wasn't his words but i'll not repeat them but uh, so it was always about running it cold and running it slow because the quality was there so we actually run the spirit at less than five liters a minute i suppose then the next big one was the the cut you know the the alcohol cut and coming from triple distilled ochintoshin basically we had a 81 percent new make spirit so obviously we couldn't do that with double distillation but we kept the cut slightly higher than most double distills so we're sitting at a 71 percent cut so it starts to run in about 76 and a half we, we cut it at 71 probably an average then about 72 and a half percent alcohol that we feel as though is delicate it's clean there's no off notes it's you know it's, it's not fainty it's not oily it's it's fresh is what we would say and you know a lot of the fruitier notes come tend to come through on the on the nose there so we ran with that and then I think the next thing is the, the wood policy is important. You know, there's no point going back to the 1984 days and lead patches on barrels and there's no point making a really good new make spirit and, and putting into inferior wood. So I think it was all about getting a, a really good wood policy. And we've done that with the, the help of the late Dr. Jim Swan as well. So there was a, a wood policy in place that, we, you know, just to make sure that we've got cover for, for going forward. So we're, we're working with that. And I think the whole combination right through from the, you know, the growers group right through to the, the wood quality, it all plays its part. And I, I think that's important for, and, and consistency from now on. And, you know, it's, uh, it really is, it's, it's about keeping the, the new make character consistent. Yeah. yeah. You, you especially mentioned uh, the, the, the yeast and yes. I think that's interesting because I always had the feeling that uh, Scottish distillers do not care a lot about yeast. Uh, brewers do and Americans do, but you seem to care about yeast as well, right? Yes, I had been involved with a lot of trials previously before I came here and, and different types of yeast from liquid yeast to pressed yeast to dried yeast. And, you know, everybody has opinions on it, but there's different ways of working with the yeast and, and whether you rehydrate it, whether you pitch it straight or whether you, you know, you mix it beforehand and uh, dried yeast and, and there's different types of dried yeast. So we, we've stuck with the same one that I've known since the probably the early 90s that I first started using this particular yeast and it really works well. Some people don't feel as though they get the, the real fruity character out of it, but I think what we're proving here is we're, we're managing to achieve that with fermentation times, set temperatures and then you know, just uh, keeping a close eye on, on the processes and the operators. So, so taste-wise, stop cross will be fruity, lowlandish, uh, not peated in any respect. Uh, can you yeah. describe the taste a little bit more? Yeah. So for me, stop cross is is a it's a lowland style. It is fruity. It's got a good bit of depth of character. It is also a marriage of both bourbon and sherry. So you're getting contrast and flavors there as well. A, a really long finish, I would say. It's more of a kind of flavors are, are, are still going on, but definitely a fruity character with some kind of peppery notes, kind of spiciness in the background as well, you know, so I kind of finish, but very interesting. And I'm sure Andrew's got some opinions on it as well. Well, and, and you know what he thinks it's it's definitely for me it's a typical it's, it's better than a typical lowland i must admit and i'm going to say that anyway uh, but it's it re we're really pleased with it and you mentioned pete but i suppose yeah, you could you could we're good i mean there is so i you know i think it should be i should mention that when when we started this whole project and sat down with alice to say what we wanted to achieve we said listen spirit 
is first and foremost over everything else. And and that's, you know, it, it was appealing for us to do this in Glasgow because we think, and we, 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 before the pandemic happened, it's clear that the, the, there's a great opportunity here to really be a popular tourist destination as well. We And that was one of the reasons we did that. But obviously our, our, our family heritage is in Glasgow. So it felt like we were coming home, but the danger was always being seen as a tourist attraction. And so I said to Alistair, absolutely number one objective over everything else is the quality of spirit. And, you know, our, our capacity is just over half a million liters. So it's not like we were doing 3 million liters and pumping out 2 million of that towards a blend. It was all, it was, it was a very achievable goal of, of creating the spirit that we wanted. And then when it came to the character, we said a typical Lowland, but with a bit more depth to it, with a bit of kick to it. And so, yeah, I think we're there. I mean, the, the stop cross is almost four years old. Um, it probably would have been released earlier, you know, pre-pandemic. But because that was a, people would visit our distillery and, and um, through no fault of theirs, they would just say, so where can I buy your whiskey? while we don't and, and you can see the disappointment on their face so uh it it, it the, f- the first at three years would be more to have you know facilitated all the people visiting but now to have an extra eight nine months in woods has certainly helped this first release so so we're very happy about it and then we do do two weeks a year of of peated production i see yeah that's yeah that's yeah. Uh, that we're looking forward to that with with the new mix spirit, it was like walking into a distillery on Isla, uh, the two weeks that we do it is an incredible change. Uh, and we've went, you know, a, a heavily peated uh, spirit as well, which is l- looking really forward. So you've got that fruit, that sweetness, but you've also got, a, you know, a, a heavy peat. And that'll be certainly one to watch out for in the coming years as well. So it's uh, looking forward to that. That sounds very interesting. And, um... My next question is, uh, the first whiskey is always an important milestone, right? Uh, but for distillery, the, the years after that, when the first hype uh, diminishes, this is like a walk through a dry valley in some kind of way. So what is planned to keep Clydeside in the spotlight and uh, in the interest of the whiskey community? I, I think, when, so for instance, um, you know, being a family owned business, we have the ability to play around with some stuff. And that's what Alice, we kind of have fun with this yeah. now, where the, the first two and a half years were always just, it was always hurdles as far as opening the business center, production, or, and now we're at the stage where we're actually doing some fun things, where we're, we're, we're trying some different woods, we're, we're, we're playing around with some stuff. And it's too early to tell where we're going to be with that. But being a small family business, we can play around with that stuff. So I think there'll be some interesting things down the road. But even just something like the Stop Cross, that's going to be an evolving product. Yeah. So the release next year will be different to what's coming on the shelf this year. The release the following year will be the. It will all just be. I mean, it, it will be subtle, but it will be older. Maybe the percentage of sherry will change a little bit, and. Um, we're not looking for exact consistency at this stage in everything we're doing. We want people to be on this journey with us. Uh, and then, yeah, it would be nice when we're at 10 and we can say this is our standard 10 year old and it's going to be the same everywhere you go and the release is always going to be the same. But up until that point, uh, we have a rough idea of what we're doing, but some of it's just kind of like, oh, I think that could be fun to do. Yeah. And, and so it, it's definitely evolving, but there will be a couple of core releases up until we get somewhere like 10, but they'll be evolving for sure. So if I understand you correctly, there will be some kind of house style that would be the the Kleitzer distillery style, but you try to experiment, to try out things, to bring some diversity into your portfolio, right? Yes, Yes, I think from the the new make character style, you know, that that will remain as our signature new make character style. But as you know, there's, there's so much we can do and, you know, the various different woods. I, I'm not sure the word experiment is one that I, I quite like, to be honest, but, you know, the, there are proven ways of, of doing different expressions and, you know, the wood policy goes a long way. And yes, I totally appreciate that Stop Cross will, 
will change and, and we will have a signature malt after you know 10 years but i think there's you know there, there's wine there, you know there's various different things we can do that we know that this spirit is going to work really well with and it is exciting as andrew mentioned it was all about consistency the first two and a half years to make sure we get that product where it is i now we've got consistency with the new make spirit we can now move some casts around and have some finishes or you know have some marriages have some single cast release some cast strengths non-cast strengths you know there's just so many things and i think it's uh, this week i think get it out there see what the consumer's feedback is and then you know obviously look at the markets and, and see what's uh, that's open to us I, I mean one of our disadvantages is uh, it's an advantage and a disadvantage you're a very very small team here and so we don't have the benefit of a marketing department coming up, planning fights. So a lot of it does kind of just, we say, oh, it's something like this. And then in six months, it'll be in the market and it'll be short and it'll be, so it, 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 it's fun to do things like that without having to run it through three different yeah. levels of, of the business to get approvals. So um, yeah, we're, we're trying not to, to, obviously we take the, the, the whiskey making uh, very seriously. But we also um, don't feel that we're constrained in what we're doing and we're, we're going to play around with some stuff. Yeah, I love how you call having no marketing team a disadvantage and an advantage at the, at the same <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah. So, Andrew, yeah. Alistair, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, all the best for the future. I'm so much looking forward to the stop cross when it comes to Germany. Hope to see you again and the next time in person in Glasgow. Ooh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.